Okay, here we go. <laughs> I, I hit the Facebook Live, and um, well, first, um, let me just say, uh, just pray. Lord, uh, I just thank you for using me another day, Lord, to pour out your spirit, Lord. I just ask that you make my tongue like the pen of a writer, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for just continuing to instruct me and teach me and guide me, Lord. And I open up the hearts, O oh Heavenly Lord. Open up the ears so they will yet hear this word, O oh Heavenly Father, that it will pierce their hearts, Lord. Use me, Lord, or oh Father, Lord, not me and my mouth and my tongue, but your will will be done on this line tonight, Lord, and it will go far and go forth out into the world. We just thank you, Lord, for using us again in a gathering here today, Lord, uh, to just come together and, and speak your word and gather in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, I just thank you all so much. It's been a while uh, since I've been on the line here. And if anyone is on Facebook Live, you can definitely log in to go to my page and uh, hear it on audio or definitely give me a thumbs up if you can hear me on Facebook Live uh, for sure. But uh, I just want to speak first to what Pastor McCoy said. Um, I guess it's been... I think this is my first time on this year, I believe. I don't think I've been on for about four or five, six months. Um, but uh, I think the last time I spoke, um, some things were uh, coming to pass. And we are in the process of having our first uh, vision casting next month here in uh, Huntsville, Madison area, North Alabama. So, um, yes, I, we're definitely... Uh, stepping out there and all on the line, all on Facebook, definitely uh, keep our work for G Church in, in prayer. And uh, where our motto is, you know, it's the same mission, uh, different approach, same Jesus, different generation. You know, if you're looking for to shake hands with destiny, definitely. Uh, that's, that's our whole thing is seek Jesus, find identity, you will see your purpose and destiny will find you. And um, so that's, that's, and uh, people always say, well, what do you mean by destiny will find you, Corey? And uh, that's kind of going into the word a little bit. We always think we find destiny. We only have one destiny. If you seek Jesus, you'll find your identity. Then you become, you start seeing, you'll see your purpose that's already residing on the inside of you that sometimes plays dormant. But then destiny finds you when you're walking in your purpose. If you, I always used the person, um, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. When Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, his purpose was to be a pilot. But destiny put him on the moon. So again, once you find your purpose, destiny, you open up the doors to destiny. You open up, uh, destiny does not have an address. It evolves. So uh, definitely uh, here locally, that's our whole mission is to allow you to shake hands with destiny. But um, tonight, you guys know I'm an illustrator. So uh, <clears throat> I'm always trying to paint pictures. And this whole thing over the telephone and on Facebook Live, this is, uh, I'm getting hopefully better at it. Uh, but, you know, you got to do it. Uh, so hopefully I can paint a picture for you guys tonight. And... Um, just hear me. And I'm going to try to just teach this thing out. And I want to give some scriptures uh, right off the bat so you can write them down because I definitely want, don't want to be confused in where we're going tonight. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'll post these later on Facebook. But I want you to go ahead and write these scriptures down before I get into the text. Just because sometimes when I get in the text, I'm gone. But we are going to go all through Genesis 1, the entire chapter, <clears throat> through Genesis 2, just go down to maybe verse 26. Also, in going through the text, Exodus 20, Hebrews 4. Through, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Psalms 95. Leviticus 25, verse 4. I think it's verse 4 through 7, maybe. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Acts 20, hope I'm not going too fast, I'll repeat them if I need to, uh, after the call for sure, but I wanted to go ahead and get those um, out there first. Now, let's get down in this thing here. Give me a thumbs up if you, uh, that's not too fast online, just give me, if, if so, just put a note in there. But I'm going to go right through. Tonight, um, when do we rest? What is rest? R-E-S-T. And I want to make that very clear tonight as we go through rest. Because we sometimes can get rest mixed up with the Sabbath rest, rest day. And I want to break that down. It's probably a lot to go through, but I want to really be clear on what I'm saying tonight. That we are talking about rest. And I want to, uh, the original purpose, what God the Father originally ordained, what rest meant and what it means to us. And uh, so, <clears throat> and I put on my uh, thing here on Facebook. When do you put the paintbrush down? <laughs> So here, here we go. Let's go on down this string. If you had to think of an, uh, um, a famous um, artist or a painter, walk with me in my visual here. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Who's the first painter that comes to your mind? Possibly uh, Mona Lisa, Mike, uh, who did uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Van Gogh, Picasso. Those are some real known artists, right? Well, tonight we're going to talk about uh, I'm going to use, I'm not saying you have to like his work, but I want to use this illustration here for me of Leonardo da Vinci, which also um, what he did was he painted the Last Supper. OK, and that's not what we're talking about tonight, but he painted that. Now, get this. This guy, this is in the uh, 1400s is what I believe it was. Now, this picture that he painted of the Last Supper, get this, Leonardo da Vinci. You go, I want you to get a, a visual of how big the Last Supper portrait that he took. It wasn't a canvas. It wasn't a small piece. This was as wide as 10 yards, meaning a first down for football, as wide as that. But it was as high as 15 feet, a few feet above a NBA uh, basketball, probably the top of a backboard. That's how wide this picture was. Now, he painted this on drywall at the time. This is in the 1400s. It took him three years to paint this picture. Okay? So, you say, it took him three years to paint a picture? What was he doing? What was he thinking? Good question there. What was he thinking through this whole process? So, why would it take somebody three years? Now, he worked on and off. So, what happens with a, an artist? They go and they add something back to it. They go over here, they paint. And then they say, oh, man, I want to add this to it. I want to do this and let me go away from it. Because uh, from talking to variations of different people and artists, you have to be in the, the art has to fall on you, so to speak, if I can say that. Um, so it took him three years to make this portrait. Huge, huge, huge portrait. However, when you're talking about him, he painted on a drywall canvas. And when you first think of artists, when does an artist's work become very valuable? When does that happen? That's right. When they dead. It makes it kind of, kind of wild. An artist's paintings doesn't become extremely of value until they are dead and gone. So this is now 500 plus years, 600, 500 plus years later, and we're still talking about that same portrait. However, this same portrait that Leonardo uh, da Vinci did, it started to go bad after a few years, 60 or 70 years, because he didn't put it on a normal canvas. It started to go bad. And after about 60 or 70 years, they had to do some reconstruction. They had to revive it and bring it back to life. And trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. He, they had to bring a portrait back to life. And a lot of people didn't like that because it may have changed some colors and it did some other things. So I wanted to paint a picture as, as we talk about this, when does a painter 
know that he's finished with the brush. When does he say, hey, that picture, in today's world, we may say drop the mic. When do you drop the mic on that picture? When does it come to perfection is what I want you to think about in your head when we're going through these scripts today. He's got this humongous picture and he's over a three year period. He's painting this picture. But when did Da Vinci say this picture is done? Now, in order to answer that question, we're going to go now to when does the Lord say I'm done? And when did he drop the brush? When did he drop the brush? But in order to do that, we got to go all the way back to the original creation of rest. So that means we have to go right into Genesis 1. And as I said, I'm not going to read all of the necessary scriptures, but in day one, in day one, what we have to know what he made in day one. He made light in day one, not sunlight, but he made light. I don't have time to go into the different uh, forms of the light. So then in day two, what was formed? The sky. Kind of go back to what happens with a painter. You start to paint certain portions of the picture and then all of this thing starts to come together. Day three, what did he make? Dry land. Day four, what did he do? The sunlight, the stars, the moon, the atmosphere. So day five, I mean, uh, day uh, five, he put the fish and the fish of the sea and the variations of things. So that's what's made. All right. Day six, what was made? Well, in the early part of the day, and I'll get into this because the days were divided into the night and then of the day equal one day. So in the first early part of that day, he made all of the animals and the veggies that walk the earth. This is key. I'm going to come back to this. So in the early part of the day, in the early, in the first part of the day, man wasn't made in the first part. Because when you go into the scriptures, it says, and then man was made. So in the early part of the day, he was putting the cows out there. He was putting the, uh, some chickens out there. He was putting the vegetables out there. Now, at this time, man was only eating Vegetables, but later on, when you'll, you'll see down in Genesis 9, I believe it is, that's when he said, Hey, go ahead and eat you some chicken if you want to. But we're not, well, that's not what we're talking about tonight. So, in day six, he makes man in the eve of day six. That's key. Now, what am I saying when I say that? When I say in the eve, meaning at the very last moment of day six, is when he starts. To make man. So this is where he makes man. Now think about this now. I want you to also understand. When he was making man. It says. That he blew. He, he reached up into the dust of the earth. I think I said this before. In Genesis there. Uh, 126 is when he made the image. He reached down into the earth. Into the earth. The dirt. <sighs> he blew the dirt. Into the nostrils. OK, so think about this now. You know, we all say the, um, the Lord's Prayer, our father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth is the original translation in earth. So what he did was he picked up the earth, the dirt, he blew it into the nostrils. So in essence, who is he building? It's you he's talking about the heaven, because when you go into Genesis 1, 1, in the beginnings, he created what? The heavens with an S, plural, heavens. So you have another evidence. When he was making the atmosphere, that's everything that's upon and above the earth's heavens. So that was another. Then where's the other heavens? Heavens, is, it resides on the inside of you to be in the earth. But that's not what we're talking about. So in the nostrils, when you look up. The word nostrils is also connected to the forehead when you look up the Hebrew text of it, Alpha. And I'm not here to speak Greek and Hebrew, but when you look in the forehead, what if you peeled your forehead back, what's behind your forehead? It's your mind. So he also blew the mind of Christ on the inside of you. That's key. So in day six. He said, I'm going to blow my mind into you. That's why it says in Philippians 2 and 5, it says, let this mind be in what? In who? You. 
which who which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what he said. He told us this right in the beginning. Okay, now day six. Here we go. This is where it gets deep here. So he makes on the eve of this. So when he's coming into here, first let's say, let's ask a question. Why was man made on day not on day six? Why was he made on day six and not on day two? Let's just think about that. Well, if he was made on day two, what would have happened? Day two, we got light, not sunlight, but we got light and sky and water. He would have just been out here swimming in the water. This is what he, well, I'm sorry, the people that's on Facebook, you can see me. He would have been swimming if he had been made on day two, right? So if he was just swimming on day two, because we got to remember, he's painting a picture for this thing here. He's putting it all together. If he had put man in day two, he would have been swimming. So that means he would have then not been resting, but he would have been working. It's what he would have been doing. He's trying to think, where am I? I'm going to be swimming. I can't get no food because that day two, it's no fish in the water, but it's water, but it's no fish. So I'm hungry and I'm just swimming and I got a sky. So, right. So you got to put all this together. It was, he's painting a picture for us. So in day six, he's saying to man, I'm going to make you the very last thing. I've now put the earth out there. I've now put the sun out there. I've now put the atmosphere. I've now put the moon out there so you can keep up with the times out there. I've now put you some fish out here. I've put everything and I've made this in perfection. Now, in day seven, is what the word says. And he made him now in the eve. So rest comes on day seven. He said, now we all know. God the father did not rest on day seven for us. For himself. He wasn't tired. He made all of this stuff. Now this is key. Many, many people. I'm not teaching on the Sabbath day right now. But this is going to intertwine a little bit. A lot of times we automatically, a lot of people have taught us over the years that right here, the Lord was teaching us to have a Sabbath day right here. Well, first of all, he couldn't be teaching man to have a rest Sabbath day because they ain't never worked. They, no sin had happened at this time. They had not failed to do any manual labor at this time. So the rest that he's talking about here has nothing to do with physical rest. He's saying, I'm going to make you on the eve of day six here, and you're going to fall right into the rest of God. Meaning you, it says enter the rest. We're going to talk about that. Enter into the rest of God is what I'm talking about. So now let's go and talk about what does that mean? really mean was he saying I'm too tired no was he saying rest uh later on because in Exodus 20 uh, this is when the Sabbath comes in now at that time who is he talking to he's talking to the Israelites at the time because this is this is later on in Exodus so I want you to guys to clearly hear me here I'm moving forward now the rest that was made in Genesis on day seven was not the day. He's saying you enter the rest of God. The rest, the Sabbath rest, the day, keeping it holy in Exodus 20, verse eight, the fourth, the Sabbath day. He was telling this. Watch this. You got some Israelites. They've been in slavery, right? They've been working. All they know is work, work work, work. They don't know anything about a day off physically at this time. So I'm going to put this in today's time. I got to go to, I got to work this overtime. I can't afford to have no days off. I don't have time to go to no church. I ain't got time to go to no Bible studies. I got to go to work because I got to make this money because my kids got to go to college, college fund. I got the utility bill due. I got all of these different things doing. All they doing is working, working, working. So all they knew was slavery. That's all. They didn't have any insight of anything else. Okay. So this is where God says, hey, this is when he gave the Ten Commandments. And I'm just concentrating on the Sabbath day right there. He says for the Jewish people right there, the Israelites, y'all been in slavery, but this is what you got to do. I need you to sit down and rest. Now, mind you, this is now after the fall. Prior to the man fall, 
It was no rest. Adam and Eve was chilling. It's no, it's no rest here. So in day seven, he said, enter into my rest. And you just enter into me. You rest in me. You have comfort in me. And we, I'm going to show you that in scripture. So I wanted to first have a clear difference of which rest that I'm talking about. I'm talking about entering the rest. So if you have your Bibles, go to Hebrews 4 for me. Hebrews 4. And we're going to go down through this scripture here. I apologize, it's going to take me a minute here. Give me just a second. But Hebrews 4, I want to talk about and I want to read this. Now, I don't know why I decided I want to never read from the computer. But in Hebrews 4, I want to break this scripture down. Okay? Hold on here. I dropped my Bible earlier and my pages are all over the place. So, but I like to look at my own Bible because I got some notes there. So, all right. Let's look at Hebrews 4. And I'm just going to go down through this. And I'm reading from the NIV. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not, did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed entered that rest just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since when the creation of the world. Okay. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest. That's key. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day calling it when? Today. When a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Now, I know that was a whole lot. That was Hebrews 4, 1 through 11 is what we just read. And I had to read all of that. So now let's break that text down. Where, where was he talking about here? Well, again, he says, therefore, since the promise has entered, therefore, since the promise entering his rest still stands, what rest is he talking about? In this text, he's talking about the Israelites that were coming out of slavery. They were disobedient because they could not enter the rest at that time. The rest that he had promised them is what he's talking about here. Now, wait a minute. What is he talking about? He said, I'm going to show you a land. Canaan is where he's talking about. Now, those disobedient people that he's talking about, none of those people that came out of Egypt, only two. Joshua and Caleb actually entered the rest. 
Where is the rest? The promised land. It was Canaan. When he says, I'm going to give you milk and I'm going to give you honey. I'm going to give you all of this good stuff. You're going to get a chance to rest in him. Enter the rest. So here again, he's not talking about, quote, the Sabbath day rest right here. He's talking about entering the rest of God. And that's what he's saying. He says, wait a minute. I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That's deep. Where did that come from? That came from Psalms 95 is what he's talking about there. But let's just go back. Now, let's say he said in there, for if Joshua had given them rest, meaning they didn't want, remember, Joshua was leading the people after Moses left. Joshua means salvation. So what he was saying is if you had yet followed Joshua, you would have then entered my rest. But see, they didn't want to enter his rest. They, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute, is where he says, uh, oh, when you go down in Psalms 95, uh, it talks about all of the things that they did. The people, how do you fall away from God? How do you not enter rest? How? Wait a minute. This is pretty deep for the Lord to say, wait a minute. They will never enter my rest? Never will they enter his rest. Remember, Man was made on day six in the evening. So they was the last thing made and he's about to enter into the day seven. So what they was entering into was they had this. Everything was already complete back in Genesis. Everything he said, I'm going, you're going to just enter this and all you got to do is rest in me. Now, the people, he was trying to then prove this again back in the Old Testament to the Israelites. He said to the people, hey, I want y'all to enter my rest. But why didn't they enter my rest? If you go over to Psalms 95, he was very upset at that time. And just to go over some bullets, and, and when you look at some of the words in here, it's saying some of the places in uh, Psalms 95 and 7, Mariva uh, and Maka, which is strife and contention. And when they were being tested in despair uh, or a trial that they were having, they were doubting God. What kept them from entering the, God, entering the rest? And I just broke it down here. Ungrateful heart. That stops you from entering the rest. This is what he's saying in Psalms 95. If you read that whole text, when you stop worshiping, you don't enter the rest. Not submitting, you don't enter the rest. Harden of hearts, you don't enter the rest. The doubt of God. So this disobedience is when you fall apart. From God, and this is what the Israelites were doing at that time. He was he was telling them then as well, enter my rest, people. But they chose not to enter the rest of God, not the day. Now, see, they were following the law, and we're going to get into that here in a minute. So, when you disobey God, many times, um, what happens is when you sometimes you want to do all of the works of God, the work meaning. Going right back to, I want to work. I got to work seven days. I'm only been in slavery because that's what he's talking about, the Israelites here. He made that Sabbath for them. Hey, he's saying, sit down, rest, keep upon me, keep it holy. No, -uh, I got to go. I can't be going to church. I got to work. I got to work. I got to work. When you try to do things, even in the New Testament, I believe it's when Mary and Martha are there and Jesus is there. Um. Jesus tells Martha, hey, get out of the, I'm paraphrasing. He says, get out of the kitchen, come out of that kitchen and get in here so you can hear me. He was then saying, rest in me. And she's over here trying to work and clean up the house and come here, rest in me, rest. And this is why you, you would say, why in the world would the Lord say, don't do anything for, for, for one day? Why was he telling them that? He was trying to teach them something in the Sabbath rest, in the Ten Commandments. He was trying to teach them, if you just rest in me, you're going to have all, you, I'm going to give you more than that one day's uh, uh, of wages that you missed. So I'm going to still pay your utility bill if you don't get the overtime. Watch this. I'll show you. Leviticus 25 and 4. That talks about the Sabbath year the sabbath year in leviticus 25 when you read that so every seven years the fields then had to rest so what does that mean 
So that means we're not talking about Sabbath days, but it's the same exact principle is what I'm about to give you here. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Day in year six, he says, hey. On the seventh year, I don't want you to pick nothing. I don't want you to plan anything. So think about this. If I don't plan anything, how I'm going to eat the following year? He said, hey, don't worry about it. What I'm going to give you in year six, you're going to have enough to eat for that year. Because remember, you got to eat that year still. You got to then eat the next year. But then the year that you didn't plant, you got to eat then too. So that sounds like to me, and again, you have to go in there and to Leviticus 25, 4 and read about the Sabbath year. I'm going to give you three years worth of grocery, not just for you, for your children, for your work. You got a business for your workers. I want everything to just stop. I'm not saying anyone just stop working. But what I'm sharing with you here is this is what he was telling them to do. He says, stop, sit down. If you just rest in me. That's what he's talking about. Enter my rest. This is what, and this goes along with, quote, the Sabbath is what he was telling the Israelites at that time. And I'm not teaching on the Sabbath at this time. Now, Jesus was telling us the difference between rest and Sabbath. I'm going to show you here. Okay. Now you say, wait a minute now, Corey. And I see this is where you start. What you trying to teach right here? If the Sabbath was in the Old Testament, when you read in the New Testament, there's only one law of the commandments that's not brought over into the New Testament. And it is the Sabbath day. He didn't tell you not to enter his rest. The Sabbath day, which I'm not getting into all of that. I'm not taking away the Sabbath. The Sabbath still exists. I'm not taking that away. But you have to understand who it was made for as well and how we, I'm not here to tell you why, what day to worship. You worship on any day you want to. But I'm saying, did Jesus ever kill anybody? No, he didn't kill nobody. Did he commit adultery? No, he didn't commit adultery. Did he lie to anybody? Didn't lie to anybody. Did he speak against God's name? No, he didn't. So basically what I'm saying is, did he go against any commandment? Technically, did he do any works on the Sabbath? Yes, he did. Now, was he breaking the commandments? He can't break his own word, right? No, he cannot break his own word. So what am I saying right there? So what was he really trying to teach right here? He was trying to show them of that day. Look here, y'all. And I just want to break this down, guys, into layman's terms here. He was trying to say... Uh, he was teaching them legalism uh, and, and religion uh, practices of that day. This is why the Pharisees, Sadducees, was coming at Jesus saying, hey, you cannot do any works on the Sabbath. You cannot do that. He says, wait a minute. I'm doing the will and works of my father. So if it was against God to do some works on the Sabbath, Jesus wouldn't have done it. He was then trying to do a separation there of listen. Not be legalism, but I want you to rest in me. So, of course, he was still resting. And I'm going to go over what all of that rest means. And, of course, later on, Paul also, and, and in the New Testament, we get into worshiping. And then on the Gentiles started to worshiping on the first day. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly. Again, I'm not talking about the Sabbath. I'm going somewhere with this on how uh, all of this rest came about. I hope y'all getting somebody this here. So why should you rest? What comes after the rest? As I, as I painted a picture earlier, a painter picture does not come to its total value until when he dies. So it sounds like to me that painter, uh, Leonardo uh, da Vinci, Picasso, Van Gogh, Michelangelo, their painters get greater value when they no longer can do any works to it, when they no longer can add any value to it, when they no longer could add any dots and everything. Once they drop the brush, and in their sense, they actually are, they are dead, meaning they are resting then. They no longer can add or do any works to a particular picture. Now, 
I like to say this with us Christians as today, I like to call us, we sometimes are OCD uh, Christians. And what I mean by that is my wife sometimes tell me I'm a little bit OCD. And what that means is I want to, uh, I want to always pick up something. It's, 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 oh, don't, don't put that paper right there. Uh, let's do this. I'm having the Martha syndrome. So I'm never resting, meaning just sit down and just relax, Corey. So what if there's a cup on the nightstand? Just relax. And this is what Jesus is trying to tell us. This is what the father was telling us from day one. When he made us, he made us in day six in the evening so you could enter right into his rest. That's exactly what he's telling us. He keeps talking about enter into my rest. Enter into my rest. He was saying that when that when you rest in him, when that painter dies, that value goes, he no longer does anything. The value is great. So when you enter into the rest, you're no longer doing the works in the will of the father. You've taken your hands off and you've given it completely to the father and the value then increases. Now watch this. What comes after the rest? Because you might say to me, hey, Corey, I know that all sounds good. But remember, you're talking about Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and then after that, man fell. So we no longer have all of that. Well, let's talk about that. What comes after the rest? Now, Revelation just told me this. The Sabbath rest. Uh, and I'm going to uh, emulate the Sabbath rest meaning the Old Testament rest, the day rest. It's kind of like if I go out of town, we have now where you can see me on FaceTime right here, right? You have me where you can see me, we can text, we can call. I like to call my wife and text my wife and FaceTime when I'm out of town. I love doing that. I'm, I love the technology. It's great, great technology. I use it. However, I would much rather be right in the bed with my wife. Mm. This is exactly what the father is trying to tell us. There's one thing to have an image of Christ, but there's another thing to have the real thing of Christ. That's why in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new, a new creature. Old things pass away. So what I'm, what I'm, what am I still saying there? When you enter the rest, when Jesus died, the rest was technically on Saturday, the Sabbath, okay? Now, why? Why does he choose to rise on Sunday morning? I, I, I can't tell you the why on why it was after the Sabbath. It was after. I mean, I could go back into Passover, but... What comes after the rest, y'all? When you enter the rest of Christ, when you enter the rest of Jesus, what happens after the rest? That means when you've entered the rest of God, when you have given the rest to him, when, when you come to him, when one believes, that's what it was talking about in um, Hebrews. When you have come to him, yet this has been, it says, since creation, this has been in effect. We talked about that. But when you enter the rest of God, no matter what you're trying to go through, uh, it says, let's go back to this. He says, your mind of Christ, he wants you to rest. He wants you to rule. He wants you to abide. Meaning when you enter the rest. What does rest mean? You then rule after that. What does rule mean? Then you abide. And I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. But when after the rest, what comes? The resurrection comes after the rest. So that means when you enter the rest, the resurrection comes. When you, I'm going to say that again. When you enter the rest, the resurrection comes. So the minute, think about this now. When did Jesus rise? When did he rise? Early. Sunday morning. Now you have to go into the days and divide them. When you entered the rest, they were resting on the Sabbath, the rest time. Then the next thing was the resurrection, meaning 
Whatever you give to Christ, he then starts to resurrect that thing. When you have a rest in him, he wants you to then rule in him. This is why on day six, that's why he didn't make man in day two, because you would have been swimming the waters. Because he was saying to you at that time, I want you to have dominion over this earth. I want you to have dominion over the sea and the fish. I want you to have dominion over the animals. I want you to have dominions over the atmosphere and over the waters. He said, everything in this earth I give to you. And what I've done, I have created and it is finished and it is complete. And now you rest in me, the father. And I'm going to give you what is here on the earth. And now you have nothing else to do but to rest in the Father. But of course we know what fell. But then he came. That's why the word says, for if we gave. Excuse me. He says, but if he gave. For if they had went through Joshua and went to the promised land, he wouldn't have had to create another day. He Then he said. First, I'm going to give you Joshua. Now I'm going to send Jesus, my son, to now give you the another time to now rest, enter the rest again. And when you enter the rest, the resurrection comes. What is What am I saying when I say enter the rest again and the resurrection then comes? He says this. When do you enter the rest? If you got dominion over the earth, you probably got dominion. See, this is Mother's Day. I lost my mother. A lot of people lost their mothers, their children. Enter his rest. See, I want to I want to explain to you what a rest means, though. Know. Just put you guys is on the line, just picture this with me. If you got a hand, it's something when you ball up your fist, and if you got something in it, if somebody slaps your fist, you automatically, instantaneously you take that fist and you back it back. It's with tension, like you ball it up as if you got something in your hand. If I put something in your hand and you ball it up, you're not resting with it. It's tight. It's clenched. This is mine. I earned this. This is my job. This is my house. That was my mother that died. That's, this is mine. You kind of have that ownership thing when you have your hands balled up. I want you to go with me with this picture here. You got your hands balled up and everything is all tight. That's not a rest. Because see, but a rest comes if you can imagine if Christ Jesus hugs you. What instantly comes to your hands? Your hands then just, just have a situation where they just open up. You start to rest in him. You just kind of fall into him. You just give it to him. He says, I, you are a friend in me. You uh, lay on his bosom is what he's saying. You rest in him. Everything is laid upon him is what he is saying. This is why when you've lost a mother, when you've lost a loved one, he says, enter my rest. When you have lost a job, when you don't have a job, when you're looking for a job, rest in me. When your children are in the world, he is saying, rest in me. When you have temptations coming your way, women, men, alcohol, porno, whatever your temptation is, he says, rest in me. When you having doubts like the Israelites were having, he says they knew they would have those, but he's saying just rest in me. And when they didn't enter his rest, then he says you will never enter the rest. But he's saying rest in me. Sickness and disease. When you got someone in the hospital, he's saying rest in me because he says I will heal all sicknesses and all disease because why? He gave you the authority to heal in your hands is what the word says. He said, enter my rest when you got people speaking lies against you. Enter my rest when they telling stories about you as they did. That was the whole thing. He said, when he was doing works on the Sabbath, they said, wait a minute. He now saying that God is his father too. This man is crazy and he's lying. But later on in the word, they knew in his eyes that it was something in him, but they still lied. He said, enter my rest when you don't know which step to take. Hear my voice is what it says in Psalms. See, when you hear his voice, then he gives you the visual to direct your steps. The hearing always becomes, becomes is before the visual. 
Whatever you're hearing in the spirit, he will eventually give it to you in the visual. Just like a blind person, their ears are heightened. Their hearing is heightened. So is yours. That's why he always talks about hear my voice. Hear my voice. Did you hear me is what he says. You have the choice whether you hear him or not. But if you choose not to hear, he's then going to, if you choose to hear, I'm sorry, he will then give you the vision. What is he giving? What are you hearing that he's giving you to see and to walk out? When you enter the rest of Christ, that's what he's giving you. When you got a marriage that's on the grounds of divorce, he is saying, enter my rest and the resurrection will come. He is saying, my, you saying my marriage is rocky. Enter my rest and I'll give you a marriage that's going to sustain every throughout. A beautiful marriage. That's what he's saying. When he says, my children are, are going to the world, enter my rest. And the resurrection is going to come early Sunday morning. And I'm going to bring my, my your children back. Enter my rest. And you won't have any more temptation. That is nothing but a trial that you want. That's a test you're going through. And the, remember this. The Lord won't test you. The devil will tempt you. But you will have... That's why he says, I give you the power. I give you to a, the authority to trample on any snake and scorpion that comes your way when you enter his rest. When you enter the rest of Christ, the resurrection of Christ comes to, to be able to defeat that. When you are fearful to make that next full step, that's why he says, enter my rest. I will... He says 360 some odd times. He knows you're going to be afraid. He knows that fear is coming, but he's saying do it anyway. He's saying jump off the cliff anyway. But if you enter my rest, I know you got me, Lord. Because when he made you, I keep saying, enter the rest. So I go back to you. When you go back to Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci said, when am I going to put this brush down? So my question to you is when are you going to put that brush down? When are you going to say, hey, I am finished with this painting. I'm going to put the brush down. And what I mean by putting the brush down, I finished the part that I can do. Because watch this. Remember that in that same painting, he had to, it took them, so the, time, the, the picture started to deteriorate after a period of years because he put it on the wrong campus. Just like sin nature came into this world and it started to deteriorate. The world is what was happening, but it's going to deteriorate. But they had, to, it took some years to bring that picture that Da Vinci uh, brought back. They had to resurrect the picture. They had to restore the picture. The same thing Christ is doing yet in us. When he said, "Bring," I'm going to bring Jesus, and after the resurrection, after the Sabbath, after the rest, what came on day one? The resurrection came on day one. Will it be some people against the resurrection? Yes. But when you enter the rest of Christ, the rest, when you enter the rest, I'm not talking about the religion or the legalism of how you look. But when you enter his rest, is all he is saying, because it says some, going back to the thing, it still remains that some will enter the rest. And those formerly had the gospel preached to them. If it's been preached to you, it's been preached to you today. On day six, he didn't put, the, he didn't put man out there on day two to go wash it in the waters. No. He put them out there when everything was finished. The original creation was done. So all we have to do is rest in Christ. That same thing resides now. It's not the rest on the other side. The rest comes now, yet in the kingdom of God. Because I told you before, our Father who art in heaven, how will be thy name? That kingdom come, that will be done in earth. That means in you. When he blew that he blew that dirt into your nostrils. He gave you his mind. So that means if you're, if his mind be in you, his mind, he blew his mind in you. You can't get away from me, Satan. My, you right. My marriage is automatically restored. You right. My finances are automatically restored. You right, Lord. I'm entering, I'm entering peace because I lost my loved one. I'm entering because I got your mind. The mind of Christ. Is what he's saying right there. So, again, just to recap, when you enter the rest of God, the resurrection of God comes. 
I hope you got something out of that. Um, just put the brush down. You got to know when to put the brush down. Give it to him. Because guess what? He never ordained you to even pick up the brush. You, re you were designed in the eve of day six to enter the rest. You don't even supposed to have the brush at all. So therefore, the answer to that is when do you pick the brush, put the brush down? The difference here is you never even pick the brush up when you enter the rest of God. Amen. 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 Lord, I just hope that um, and I pray that all hearts, minds compose and have received your word. And um, yes to your will and yes to your way in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.